This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. asked me to do a presentation for you folks, talked about a lot of different titles, he decided to settle on the one that was most cocky. That is, that we chose the title of the ultimate health plan. It sounds pretty cocky, doesn't it? <laughs> but it got a few of you here at least. Maybe it scared some other people away. So anyways, but through the years, people have tried to come up with the ultimate cure-all that's going to help us take care of all the problems in the world. And I happen to bring a few things here with me today um, that I've collected from traveling around a little bit. I have right here the remains of the great Dr. Kilmer's swamp root kidney, liver, and bladder cure. Okay? And if that doesn't fix you up, I happen to have another one here that is Otto's cure for the throat and lungs. And if that doesn't quite make it, last year I visited in Florida and stopped by the Fountain of Youth, and I've got a little bit of the water from the Fountain of Youth here that promises to fix us all up. Then you've always heard about the proverbial apple a day. Well, I happen to bring that a little bit with me. And if all else fails, I did bring my magic wand, and that will fix everybody up in fine style. But actually, through the years, I've really noticed that um, while people look for those instant cures, and we find things that maybe really work for some person, but it doesn't always necessarily work for everybody. Hello. That's one of the real challenges that life has thrown us. We're all very unique. Each have different and unique needs. So there's probably no ultimate health plan, but we're going to take a look at a few things that we have found and many people have found through the years that can really contribute not only to the quality of one's life, but hopefully to longevity of one's life. And I did bring a few slides and... Uh, Actually, I have so many slides, it was really a little bit of a challenge to figure out which ones to bring, but we'll give it a shot here. And if Robert will dim the lights, I'll go ahead and start showing some slides. The privilege back in 1980, 1981, to work at a place called Island Terrace Health Enhancement Center. This is a place between Boston and Cape Cod in uh, Massachusetts. It was just a lovely little place. We have in the foreground here, we were surrounded by cranberry bogs on the, the rest of this island was, was lake. And it was just a simply gorgeous environment. And what we had the opportunity to do is to convert this turn-of-the-century mansion into a health resort. The other part of the building was a nursing home, but the owners had had a vision for a long time about creating a place, a healing place, that people could come to regain their health based on natural health principles that have existed for many, many thousands of years. And I had the opportunity to help uh, kick that program off. As Ruth mentioned, we had a number of different modalities, healing modalities that we were involved with. We, have, uh, we did massage there for our clients. This particular gentleman is just one of the people that are one of those exciting stories that we were able to participate with. You'll see up behind the hill there, that's our center. And this gentleman, when he came to us, had emphysema so bad that he could hardly walk from here to where the movie camera, the projector is right there, without stopping a couple of times to catch his breath. And uh, during the time that we had him with us, which was about three weeks, next to the last day, we, he and I walked way down out onto the causeway here, and we didn't stop at all. 
which to me says some really incredible things were happening within his body to help facilitate that healing process in something in a case that many people find is irreversible, that we can't do anything. We can't necessarily restore lungs, but we can do a lot to help increase the strength and capacity of other parts of the body to help compensate for some of that. I don't even remember this, name's gentleman, this gentleman's name, but we had a lot of fun and we're really blessed by spending time with him. Well, as I mentioned, the kinds of principles that we are using there at the health center back in 1980, 1981, uh, a lot of those principles were established way, way back in Battle Creek Sanitarium, back in the 1800s and early 1900s with Dr. John Harvey Kellogg, the inventor of uh, cornflakes and a number of other kinds of things. He was very much involved with natural processes of healing and trying to help restore health to individuals who had lost it through improper lifestyle. Here's one of the advertisements that I found in a, an antique shop one day, and I have it on my wall now in my office, but advertising this great resort that people could come to restore their health. Now, there's nothing special about Seventh-day Adventists necessarily that we're talking about here. It's just some of the lifestyle things that we see going on in this particular group. Now, high-fiber foods are some of the things that we encourage people to increase the intake of, and that's all vegetarian kinds of things. We don't find fiber in animal products at all. But we do find great amounts of it in fruits and vegetables, whole grains, brands, and, and unrefined cereals. The good news about that is that, well, here we see non-vegetarians usually eat less than the vegetarians do, just because of the nature of the foods that they use. But the reason that this is so great is, so exciting, is that we see dramatic colon cancer rates decreasing, seeing them drop significantly. In USA and the United States, we have a very low fiber diet as a whole. And in Africa, where people are on a very high fiber diet, we see colon cancer almost non-existent, very, very low. So basically, whole grain breads, peas, beans, fruits, vegetables, cereals, all these kinds of things can really do a lot to improve the quality of our health as well as perhaps add length to our lives. Now, I find all this real interesting because I see that, as I mentioned earlier, these principles have been around for a long time. And way back in the book of Genesis, way back in biblical times, there was a reference to just this kind of a diet as being the kind of diet that is optimal for, for personal health. A vegetarian diet, just the whole animal rights and the way we treat animals and, and care for them as we're raising them for food, it's really very sad and very scary and you perhaps have seen some of those stories and heard some of those stories. Now, fast food is part of our lifestyle here in Hawaii and I happen to bring a, a fairly typical fast food meal here today and you probably can't see it real well, but I happen to bring a, a Whopper with cheese, regular fries, which are right here and a chocolate shake, or the remains of a chocolate shake. Now that's a fairly typical fast food meal for a lot of people, but how much fat is in that particular meal? Actually, there's, there's 16 teaspoons of fat in this fairly typical fast food meal. And I don't know about you, but I have a hard time imagining sitting down and eating 16 teaspoons of Crisco in one sitting, but that's essentially what we're doing. Exercise is another one of those principles, and here we have Stanley. Stanley exercises religiously, does one push-up, and thanks God it didn't kill him. That's one of the things, that's the way a lot of us look at exercise. We may be doing very good as far as nutritionally speaking, but how are we doing in the area of exercise? Another very important part of a well-balanced lifestyle. Those of us committed to animals' rights see the individual animal as important while environmentalists tend to think in terms of ecosystems and populations and of animals as resources, not individual rights-bearing creatures. So why do we do what we do? Why do normally law-abiding citizens place their liberty and reputations at risk? Why do grandmothers and clergymen and perfectly ordinary citizens place themselves in harm's way to stop lorries carrying live animals from England to Europe for slaughter? It is because we are engaged in a social revolution to recognize that humans are not the only beings of worth on this planet. 
to recognize that we are not the only creatures who feel pain and comfort and desire freedom, and that if we are to be truly considered civilized, we must take a stand, as we did for our political liberty in 1776, as we did for the liberation of African Americans, as we did for the rights of women, and as we did for the recognition of all human civil rights. For many of the early activists, it was a sense of the immortality of the soul, which Pythagoras believed transmigrated into other living creatures after its initial host expired. Pythagoras was a mathematician and philosopher who lived at approximately the same time as the Buddha, 500 BC. His, his philosophy expressed the vegetarian concept of thou shalt not kill for food, which was first noted in Greece and India. The broader concept espoused by followers of Pythagoras and the Buddha was that all killing, hence war, murder, and strife, were to be eschewed, while the transmigration of souls was the essence of the nonviolent philosophy of vegetarianism. One could not, in good conscience, eat a lamb or a chicken. It just might be Uncle Dionysius. I would hazard a guess that the animal saved by this philosophy would not cavil at the reason. And indeed, it is the first historical reference to abstention from killing and eating animals in humane history. Colin Spencer, in his excellent book, The Heretic's Feast, documents the history of vegetarianism, and indeed, it is the choice of humans not to pursue, kill, and eat animals that documents the earliest concerns for the rights of animals. These prohibitions, based on a variety of philosophical reasons, are the forerunner of the conscious choice of Homo sapiens not to impinge on the rights of other animals, not to eat them, not to wear them, not to experiment on them, not to watch them fight us or other animals for entertainment. Porphyry, born in 232 AD, lived at a time when intellectual, religious, and mystical concept were in great ferment. He wrote a series of four books entitled Abstinence from Animal Food, in which he expresses the belief that eating meat creates a violent and aggressive personality. He also condemns animal sacrifice, endorses the concept that animals are endowed with reasoning and to some degree moral perception, and are thus entitled to justice. Porphyry died in 306 AD, just before the reign of Constantine, during which Christianity, based upon Judaic tradition, was officially recognized. This had devastating effects upon Neoplatonism and its concepts of justice and nonviolence to animals, indeed to vegetarianism itself. Aquinas, who lived in the 13th century, was a Dominican theologian who codified Christian thinking and interpreted Genesis in which God gave dominion over the animals to Adam, saying, It matters not how man behaves to animals because God has subjected all things to man's power. Aquinas, who was known in his school days as the dumb ox because of his great size and lack of loquaciousness, stated that chickens were of aquatic origin so that they could be eaten during Lent and on other fast days, a case of theocratic taxonomy or appetite-driven expediency. We'll move on to René Descartes, the father of modern philosophy, who nailed his wife's pet dog by its four paws to a board and dissected the animal whilst it was still alive. We have no record of Madame Descartes' response to the ill treatment of her dog. The Pythagorean diet officially changed its name to vegetarianism in 1847 in England. In 1975, Peter Singer, an Australian philosopher, wrote the seminal work of the animal rights movement, Animal Liberation. Although utilitarian, Singer managed to place the issue before the public in an accessible manner, and his work has become the cornerstone and bible of the modern animal rights movement. According to Singer, one does not need to be an animal lover. One does not need to harbor pets. One needs to recognize that animals have rights, that they have innate and special qualities which place them outside of the purview of the human use. You may have seen us at Earth Day, Great American Meat Out, McDeath Days, Fur Free Friday, Be Kind to Animals Week, World Laboratory Animal Week. Gandhi's birthday and the Pet Expo, the Honolulu Zoo for fashion shows. 
Our bunny has delivered rejected Gillette products back to the corporate office in Honolulu, and our chicken has gone beak to face with the cockfighters' representatives at public events. We have picketed rodeos, farm fairs, and the Japanese consulate for their continued refusal to cease whaling. We oppose the killing of wild animals, whether endangered species or not, and we oppose the eradication of feral animals who are considered inappropriate by so-called wildlife managers. Uh, we welcome you to join our organization. We don't hold regular meetings like the Vegetarian Society does, but we, are, we do a lot of, of work. And if there's something that you would like to do for animals, um, just give us a call. Thank you very much. Let's bring our distinguished speaker, Dr. Howard Lyman. Get another place. Welcome. How do you like that, huh? It is a wonderful, wonderful pleasure for me to be here. Here I am, a fourth generation farmer, rancher, feedlot operator, and I travel around the world 11 out of 12 months of the year, and I talk to people about the proper amount of animal products to have in their diet as zero. I want to talk to you about the real shape of the world. Because, you know, we just had an election. We had people running for president that were telling us that we should vote for them because they were running for the most important job in the world, and they were talking to us about what those problems were. But do you realize in all of that, never one of them, whether it was Bill Clinton or Bob Dole or anyone else that was running, not one of them wanted to talk to you about the four important things that were out there. Clean air, clean food, clean water, and world population. Never one time did they ever talk about the four most important things to your children and grandchildren. This is not about what everybody else should do. This is about what each and every one of us should do. All cholesterol comes from animal products, 100%. No such thing as carrot cholesterol, cabbage cholesterol. You cannot even special order kale cholesterol, no matter how you try to do it. The bad news is cancer is going up. In four short years, cancer will be the number one killer in America. Isn't it a strange thing? The way to cut down on heart disease is to have people die younger from cancer. It's what we are putting into our bodies right now. Loma Linda University did a study. They split a room like this in half. Half of the people were meat eaters. Half of the people were vegetarian. And they found that the vegetarians live 7.9 years longer. And when that study came out, the scientific community, they looked at that and said, Oh, don't pay any attention to that. That's Loma Linda University, seven-day Adventist. You know, they just want you to join the church. But you know, in Germany, they didn't know that. They thought it was an interesting study. And so they replicated the study. And they came back and said the only problem with the Loma Linda study was they underestimated the amount of longevity of people that are not eating meat. In Finland, they looked at it and they said, gee, if you can do that by just not eating meat, what could you do if you cut out all animal products? They ran that survey and guess what? They came back and said, if you don't eat animal products, you'll live 13 and a half years longer. Do you realize that what you put on your fork right now, you will make a decision on the kind of money that it will take to buy an expensive automobile, and you're going to decide whether you're going to buy it for yourself or your doctor. Are you going to end up and send your kid to college, or are you going to send your doctor's kid to college? Those are the decisions you're making on that fork. And there is no doubt about it that the fork is the most dangerous weapon in the arsenal of the homo sapiens. Now, there's a lot of vegetarians that are out there right now and said, well, you know, I've been a vegetarian for a long time. Here we are in Hawaii. We have the largest vegetarian society in the United States. But we really haven't made a big change. Wake up. We're winning. We're winning. 
You can see that this basically is uh, the basic that, that most restaurants would do. They, they saute with the onions or the garlic, and it's basically typical, and there's, there's nothing hard about this. Garlic, you just smash it with a cleaver. Because the stew, you don't have to be a really finely chopped kind of thing. It can be messy like this. <laughs> just dump it in there. You have the garlic, you have the onions, and the way I cook my stew or my soup, I don't just dump everything at one time. I layer it, meaning that I uh, get to this stage, one third of it, and then I put more stuff into it. And as, as the two third of it, I put more stuff into it. That way, it's kind of like it's going together, more more saturated, than just dump everything in there and expect it to work, <laughs> like 30 minutes from now. So that's how I cook. This is called vegetarian stir fry sauce. And what's in it is it's a shiitake mushroom. It has shiitake mushroom, it has water, extract of sugar, and then soy sauce, soy protein, and corn sauce, and then caramel to, to make it thick. And I would use that also to give it flavor. I want to make, I want to propose to make a, a base, base stew, meaning that stew from the beauty bait, you can make it into a uh, curry. You can also make it into uh, however, but you need to have a foundation for it. And uh, basically the foundation I'm going to introduce is are uh, these elements I'm going to use to make the, the stew, okay? Stew will consist of lemongrass. This is my favorite herb. Wonderful flavor enhancement into your, your stew, okay? And the ingredient is, well, whatever I come to like. And, uh, of course, the curry. The curry, I picked out this one here. The reason that it's mainly in oil, but I won't be using a lot of oil in this one. But just because it's the chemistry with oil, along with the spices, meaning the, the turmeric, the chili, the clove, the ginger, the cumin, coriander, the anise, cinnamon, allspice, garlic, soy oil, and so forth, added to make it wonderful flavor enhancement for the curry. The way I uh, bring up the stock, I use a lot of spices to give it flavor. One of it is I use a cinnamon bark. This is actually from the, the, the tree itself, and I strip it out, and I use the bark to make the, the soup more flavor. I don't have time to make the, um, the soup stock, so what we're going to do is we're going like, to cut time and we're going to put the radish, the, the carrots, and also the, the little bit of cabbage on to make the, the soup flavor, more flavor into it with the vegetable. Uh, excuse me, the co coconut I use is low-fat coconut. I also use straw mushroom to go into the, the, the curry. And of course the potato, I use a sweet potato, the Okinawan potato, the, they call it the purple potato. The flesh inside is purple. And of course I'm going to use a tapioca also. It's, I think it's the same family potato as well. Now we can get started. I don't have the vegetable stock, so I'm just going to add water, right, directly into it. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to chop up the onions. When I cook, I don't use any basic ingredient. I just use whatever comes out to my mind and I just do it. <laughs> I like also the red onion to give it flavor. This is going to be for the salad later on. Also, uh, black bean garlic sauce. I will be using that to saute in as well. Uh, you can find this at Chinatown as well. One thing I like about this knife, the cleaver, is it's so practical. I use this also as a spatula as well. I pick it up and I just put it into the, oops, into the pot. Because we don't have the, 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 the vegetable block, what I do, I use the hydrolyzed vegetable powder. And you can buy this at Down to Earth as well. And you use some of this into it, give it flavor. And I don't have measuring uh, tactic. <laughs> I just simply go by the feel of it. They call it vegetarian stir-fry sauce. And what, what's in there, the main thing that makes it so good, I think, is the mushroom. They put shiitake mushroom in there. Yeah, that's why it's in there. This thing can be able to wash this for me, the cinnamon bark, please. And this will be in there as well. I'm going to use it for the stew, okay? Three, three boxes, fine, okay? Now, with the lemongrass, you cut out roughly about but mostly most of the flavor comes from the second half the bottom trunk and that's what we're going to use I want to cut it out you see how this thing forms into a trunk like this yes and what you want to do is you want to go cut in halfway and then go back to quarter way and then I don't know what you want to call it but anyway you go down like this once you cut it halfway and quarter way you break it out and it will just come out strip by this 
when you make something like this, like stew or some kind of soup, make a lot of it and save it. Just freeze it up, buy one of those plastic containers and, and freeze it up. And when you're ready to, to eat, take out a portion of it and make it to anything because the soup base, the soup stock can be well for seasoning as well. I use that for stir fry seasoning also. I wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning <laughs> and I, uh, I look at the magazine, what, what's in the chili? And I find out it's just a chili powder and then a little bit of the corn flour, something like that. So I just compose something and I just whip it up within two or three hours. And I brought it there and I guess I taste it and then they give me second place for that. So <laughs> this is kind of like in between Thai salad that you will see. Yeah. yeah. Or Vietnamese salad, almost like that. We use a lot of mung bean uh, noodles. So. But I don't want to call it from the east or from the west. <laughs> because, you know, soybean is pretty much from the west as well. So just how you be able to manipulate these things to make your own dish, yeah? And this is finished. This is the salad right here. It's finished. See? Okay? We have the Toronto garnishing on top of that. Okay? I forgot about this thing, the baby bok choy. Oh, so cute, yeah? The thing with the, 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 the dark green leaves like this, you get calcium out of this. Practically every vegetable. And this one, I would say, is the highest. Full of vitamin and, of course, it's green like this. Lots of calcium in there for you. Oh, the broccoli! What are we going to do with the broccoli? Okay, so we, we didn't use the, the flower part of the broccoli to spring around top the... So you're getting the calcium here. Most of the calcium. Okay? So you have... And... And you have your sprout, you have your zuki bean, you have your lentil, you have your, your mung bean sprout, all right, on top of that too. This will be your... And the curry right go right on top of that. Wow, you're not missing any nutrients. And because if you're not used to eating raw, you have the, the, the stew to drown away the taste if you're not used to the, the raw taste, yeah? So it's kind of like cheating, but it's not. I think the curry is ready. We can eat now. Oh, that's okay. I'll try to stare. I'm morning open and I'm not closed. How's everything? Okay. It's not really uh, a sort of healthy, is it? Like this, no? It's called musical speaker. When, when the music stops, grab a speaker and they can start speaking. I see the children, you see the children. We all care about them so much. And you nurture them, you feed them, you give them the sustenance to grow. I can't think of any more important job in the world. We have the responsibility to educate our children. Here is an adult handing them their food, saying not only here is your sustenance for this day, but here is what we adults think is good food for you. And as we know, children are very impressionable. And they take that example. And indeed, they eat it for the rest of their lives. We are not to obligate carnivores. We have no need for the flesh of animals. It's okay not to eat the stuff at all, or at least reduce it to a very minimal part of the diet. No one has ever been found dead, face down, 30 yards from the Burger King, one whopper away from salvation. There is no subacute chicken deficiency. There is no chronic cow's milk deficiency either. Most humans on planet Earth grow up without ever drinking cow's milk, and they do just fine. I'd like to now introduce Susan Campbell, who will tell you about another equally important aspect of uh, evolving our diets to truly health-enhancing foods. Thank you. Todd and I have been working the Healthy School Lunch program for four and a half years, and when we first went into schools and started talking with food service, they were kind of like going, you know, we're feeding kids what they want to eat, we're doing well, we finally got our cafeteria running in the black, <laughs> and everything's just fine. And he said, you know, the kids won't eat it any way we've tried, and we said, let us talk to them. So we went in and we started giving classroom presentations to stimulate a consciousness in kids because the, the advertising that they are getting bombarded with 
is making them just make unconscious food choices all the time. And we can ask kids, how many of you eat at Burger King, Pizza Hut, McDonald's? And they'll all just raise their hand very proudly. And then we'll say, how many of you think it's good for you? And they'll all pull their hands down. So on some intuitive level, they already knew that it's not good for them, but they don't know how. And we go right in and show them clips of this um, Diet for a New America video, which actually has a clip of Dr. Clapper showing the open heart surgery and the uh, fat in the blood serum like he, he spoke about today. So it gives a wonderful visual of it. And kids can see what's happening in their arteries right now. And then we take them on a journey to the, through the planet and tell them how powerful they are in creating their own future and how powerful we all are together. And that the only reason we're burning rain for us is because we're gobbling up cheeseburgers. Because kids sit there in wonderment and go, why are they doing that? And we're saying, because you're ordering the cheeseburgers. But kids do not have to be victims of heart attacks and strokes and cancers. They can prevent these diseases. And they are quite motivated. At the end of a classroom presentation, we'll say, how many of you, if you could have this food readily available in your society, would want to start trying it? And we usually get most of the children raising their hand quite, quite happily. Kids are interested in solutions. This is the curriculum that EarthSave has come out with. If we were to go in the community, give classroom presentations, have the teachers follow up on the curriculum. We have a food service training video that was actually produced with Jennifer Raymond. She gives a full lecture to food service and gives a food demonstration for several different recipes. They're all to fit within the commodity program, the meal pattern requirements and your budgetary restraints. All of the menus, they're all plant-based option menus. Right now, most of our education that comes to schools comes to us from industry, the dairy industry, the cattle association, and this is industry that has a vested interest. So now we have people like Hawaiian Electric, American Cancer Society, EarthSave. We have a booth here at the conference this afternoon where we'll be displaying many of our materials that you, many of you can use and we're still going to be touring the island for about the next week, but we'll all be at the booth at the Vegetarian Society booth this afternoon. So please do drop by and visit us. We wanted to share some of the dishes that we have come across through recipes, we've, you know, different books that we've seen. And we wanted to kind of expand just the idea that you need to have chips or veggie sticks to eat dips and spreads. We have such a busy lifestyle, fast-paced lifestyle, and I think that all of us come home and a lot of times we are really hungry and we want to find something easy to eat, quick to eat, and fast to prepare, as well as being nutritious. We have found that dips are great to use as fillers. When I get hungry, I get hungry really fast and right away and I need to get something in my mouth. And I know that if I don't have something healthy to reach for, I'll tend to reach for whatever is available. Each of us prepared uh, three dips for you tonight. And kind of our goal was kind of to teach you and show you that it, it can be really easy. It doesn't have to be something that's really difficult. So that you can come home, you can throw it in a blender, and you're done with the cleanup and everything within 20 minutes. And you've got something good to eat. Tonight I did a beet dip, a black bean hummus dip, and a cauliflower dip. I'm going to show for you how easy it is to make this black bean hummus dip. Two, two cups of black beans, some cumin powder, some samari and balsamic vinegar, and some garlic and tahini, sesame tahini. So this will be a little noisy. It's all done. You're done. You've got a protein meal right here. It's really simple. I've learned that it's not good to heat oils up to really high temperature. So a lot of times what I try and do as, as often as possible is be to steam, you know, your, your food. So what I'm doing is I'll put a little bit of garlic and onions 
in the dish and then just cook it by steaming it with a little bit of water. If you get it hot enough, the water will evaporate. Butter and onions and garlic that I'm just simmering in a little bit of water. I'm sure a lot of you probably eat kabocha squash, but if you're not familiar with it, this is what it looks like. I'm going to add the kabocha cubed. I partially cooked it at home. So anyways, this is just to show you how easy and simple it is. You simmer this for a while. Using this water method, a lot of times I will put everything in together. I can put in the miso and almond butter and some salt. So this is, again, the salt and the almond butter and the miso. And I'm cooking it all together. And then once it's cooked and soft, then what I do is I plug this in and I just blend it right in the pan. What I want to do is to just give you a little bit of background about how I got into this, how I met Antonia, and what we're doing here in Hawaii this time. I first began working to try to improve the school lunch program in 1978. As a result of the, the McGovern's committee, McGovern Committee study on human health and nutrition, they found that the health problems in the United States were based on eating too much fat, too much cholesterol, too much saturated fat, too much sodium, too much refined flour, too many simple sugars, and not getting enough fiber, not eating enough fresh fruits and vegetables and whole grains. And this was certainly reflected in the school lunch program. And I was at that time teaching vegetarian cooking throughout the county where I was living. And I was approached by the local school and asked to come in and work as a consultant and help them get some healthier meals into the schools. Instead of serving apple pie, we served them whole apples. And we put on tofu tortilla casserole and all kinds of wonderful organic greens instead of iceberg lettuce. We were really thrilled with the program, and there was only one problem. The kids weren't. <laughs> Almost everything ended up in the garbage. Turned out they really liked those apple pies, and the apple was pretty boring, and on and on and on. You see, there was nothing going on in the classroom teaching the children why we were making all these changes. We were simply foisting it off on them. That program pretty much died when Ronald Reagan came into office and declared that ketchup was a vegetable. Well, when the USDA did their survey of school lunches, they discovered discovered that the fat in school lunches was about 45% of calories on average. This was real egg on the face of the USDA and they deserved it. So I realized at that time that again the children need to be involved in the process. They cannot simply be served new foods. Well, shortly after that, I came to Hawaii, and this was last year, thanks to the hard work of Cheryl Chung, and I worked with food service here in Hawaii for three weeks, and I heard the same thing over and over and over again that I had learned myself in the cafeteria. You can do healthier food, but the kids won't eat it. You can do healthier food, but the kids won't eat it. Well. Just before I had come here, I had begun reading the work of Antony Ademus, and I was really impressed with what she talked about, because she talked about going into the classroom and working with the kids around food, not lecturing them on nutrition, but doing a hands-on food-based curriculum in which she actually had the children preparing food in the classroom and tasting it. I am absolutely delighted to have Antonia hear her work. I think is just phenomenal. I know you're going to enjoy hearing about it, and I'd just like to say welcome. <laughs> Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. And most of the commodity foods that are served in the school lunch program are the high-fat animal products like processed cheese and hamburger meat. But there is a list of foods that USDA publishes that are plant-based that are never served in the school. All the dried beans, bulgur wheat, lentils, brown rice. And these are foods that if the children were, were able to eat them, their health would be much improved. The school lunch program is especially critical 
critical because poor children rely on both the breakfast program and the lunch program for free meals every day they're in school. 50 million children eat in schools every single day. Of those 50 million children, 26 million eat the USDA commodity lunch. We know that these children are going to end up with the diet related diseases such as many of the cancers, heart disease, diabetes. So what we're basically doing in this country is taking the unhealthy commodity foods and dumping them on the lunch program, it doesn't make sense because we're going to have to care for these people as they develop these diseases. I started going into classrooms because I love to cook and I love children and I would develop food-based units of study where the food was a vehicle to teach science, math, and social studies. So for example, if, if it was a science class and they had lentils, they would compare the cooking time of soaked lentils versus unsoaked lentils. They'd sprout them and they document that kind of thing. In math, they'd use the lentils for counting exercises. In art, they would make bean bags with lentils, that kind of thing. So the food was really used to teach all of the academic disciplines in the classroom. And when children get to learn about people from different parts of the world through something as tangible as their food ways, when they get to taste, smell, feel. They get very excited about this and they retain that knowledge and it's really my view that when children experience another culture through something so positive as the food and the cultural artifacts that go with the food preparation, it's, it's very exciting information that you retain. I have found that children who are supposed to be labeled as learning disabled and difficult to teach, when they get the opportunity to get out of their seats and be actively engaged in and engaging their senses as well in the whole learning experience, they really enjoy that and they retain it much better. When children actually cook foods with their peers, they will eat foods that their parents would swear they would never touch. And I did a study in the town that I live in, which is 10 miles north of Ithaca. It is not culturally diverse. I divided the school into an intervention group and a control group, and the intervention group had 16 different foods over the course of the year that they learned about. They all included USDA commodity plant foods. Within a week of my going into the 12 intervention classrooms, the new food was offered as a side dish in the school lunch program. And we went in and actually weighed the food, served it to both the intervention and the control children, and did post weights when the kids were done eating so we know exactly how much of the food the children ate. They could have fun in the classroom, but if they don't eat it, it's not going to affect their health. From the very first to the last, the intervention kids ate, ate the food up to 20 times as much as the control kids who never touched it. It's very rational for kids to reject a food when they don't know what it is. I did an evaluation that showed that the children were going home and educating their family. They were dragging their parents to the grocery store saying, I want to cook this at home. Let's know what this is. Chinese parsley, that's right. It's, it's also called cilantro, that's exactly right. Hey, we're going to be doing something with couscous. Now, do you know what couscous is? Do any of you know? Do you know what it is? Do you know what it's made out of? It's out of pasta, which is it's flour and water, basically. And it's these little, and this is whole wheat couscous, so it's healthier for you because it's the whole grain. Do you know what these are? I can't see. Garbanzo beans. Garbanzo beans. This is just a, a, this is a salad that's made with a grain and it also has beans in it, so it's a very nutritious salad. You could have it as a main dish. Let's go ahead and put this into the big salad bowl. Does somebody want to pour, there, we have two containers to pour in. We're going to put some seasonings in too. And this is oh. curry powder. Do you all know what curry powder is? Yeah. If you don't know, you can step back and smell it. It's, this is a okay. blend of lots of different spices. So you can take turns cutting the parsley and on this end you can do the cilantro.
generous qualities are water, and I emphasize water. Water will cleanse your blood better than any other beverage. Certainly do not take alcoholic beverages on a long trip. Eat carrots and other deep yellow vegetables for stroke prevention. And of course, as with every disease that we have ever worked with, a totally vegetarian diet, the vegan diet, is the most favorable. There is no disease that I can name that we have not found that the totally vegan diet is the most favorable for that disease. And so we recommend that heartily. What about fats as in avocado and olives and nuts and grains? No, those are not involved in this matter of clumping of red blood cells. Interesting feature about that. When those fats reach the duodenum from the stomach, first part of the small bowel after the stomach, a, an address label is stamped on the fat in the duodenum to tell it where to get off. Many molecules have an address label put on them, like iodine gets off in the thyroid, iron gets off in the bone marrow or the spleen, and many, many nutrients get an address label. Fat is one that gets an address label. Where does the, the combined fat with protein, carbohydrates, and, and uh, vitamin and mineral complex, where does it have its address label to get off? Well, it's in the muscles or in the liver or in other places that we can deal with fat. What about the free fats? They get an address label too. Where are they told to get off? At your hips, on your waist, in your blood vessels, just where we don't want them to. And of course, if there, if there are clumps of red blood cells in small capillaries, that will shut off the blood supply so that we don't get as well nourished in our tissues. Sugars, proteins, and minerals, which are also present in foods, and we'll get in the blood if we overeat. These make the blood too thick to flow readily. The overworked stomach in overeating drains energy from the brain and from other organs. And of course the partial or incomplete digestion produces some substances that are toxic. And I'd like just to tell you about some research. It isn't confirmed yet and it's not highly specific, but it has to do with an abnormal protein produced by overeating and produced by not chewing well enough. The protein is somewhat similar to the protein of Alzheimer's disease, the amyloid that deposits in nerve cells. And I, I suspect that future research may show that there is a relationship between overeating and poor chewing and things of this nature and uh, or other bad eating habits like drinking too much fluid with one's meal, eating too great a variety, eating off schedule and other things that make abnormal digestion, that these will prove to be a part of the Alzheimer uh, syndrome. Then the uncomfortable colon distracts the mind from higher purposes, which of course we don't like. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce a couple who, after retirement from their school teaching years, found another job, and I'm sure it's been very time consuming for them. They have been going around the island for five years teaching 10 or six or eight week sessions for two hours on their Sunday afternoons. I've been to several of them, and I can tell you that they are exciting and very worthwhile. Do Harriet and Masa Yafuso. We want to share with you the things that have helped us. You know, our bodies are wonderfully made that we don't even have to teach them. They know what to take. They know what to, to, to throw away, you know, and that's how we stay healthy. You know, we were, Masa and I were lacto-oval. We did use dairy and eggs and cheese about 15 years before 
we became vegans. But another thing too, all animal products have cholesterol and all plant products do not have cholesterol. And another really, really important thing is the fiber. All plants have fiber and all the animal products do not have fiber. So it's easy, right? If you want good health, like you said, you need good circulation. And to have good circulation, you have to put the right things into your system. Because a lot of times people tell me, oh, you know, it's too humbug. I don't want to cook like that. And it doesn't have to be. All you have to remember is try not to use any processed oil because that processed oil is really, really not good for your system. Half a cup of oil, okay, has 963 calories. And do you know what we cook? We don't think about it. Just use the oil, you know, just use like that. And half a cup of cashews have 337 calories. Oil, no protein, not 12 grams of protein. Actually, what the cashew is, is the cream or the milk. One part of cashew to four parts of water that's your milk. And so this first one here, I'm going to blend the cashew in some hot water. I use a Vitamix, and this is not a good demonstration one because you can't see inside. But what it's doing is just grinding the nuts, right? And then this is hot water. Oops. They say about, about half, about a cup in there to grind it first. If you grind it about four minutes or so, then it gets very, very smooth. Is I added the water, you know, the rest of the water. Then you just put this into the pot I did. You use, um, it doesn't say to put it in now, but the powdered um, onion and the salt, I already measured out in here. So you just put it in, put it in, put it in, and you dump the rest of the peas. This is frozen. So you don't need to cook it out here, just put your frozen peas inside. Easy, huh? Just jump in. I mean, just, just put together. The, the hard thing is getting your ingredients first. But the only thing I got from the health food store was this. The rest of the stuff I got from regular store. A broccoli and it's supposed to be cauliflower too. But guess what? I put it all in the one that you're going to taste. I forgot to keep some out, so it's in there. And uh, carrot. Isn't that beautiful? You know, really, we don't really need to think too hard because God made it so easy for us. Colorful things have lots of nourishment in it. My wife and I have been conducting vegetarian seminars for five years. During that time, whatever we have, you know, shown the people, if they follow it, you know, their cholesterol drop, their blood pressure drop, their weight drop, and they really, you know, have a better health and, you know, uh, better energy. So, you know, uh, really, it's a program that, you know, it's really good, it works. It's not a program we developed. It was developed by Wima Institute. It's an institute in California. Their program is called New Start Lifestyle, New Start. And it stands for, it's an acronym, it stands for Nutrition, Exercise, Water, Sunshine, Temperance, Air, Rest, and Trust in the Lord. Applying those eight principles, they have been able to help people overcome all kinds of illness, from cardiovascular disease to cancer to diabetes to what have you. You know, five years ago, I just retired from a teaching profession. So now I said, look, I'm retired now. I can exercise more. And I said, oh, maybe my, you know, my wife can help me with my diet. Of course, she didn't know what was good diet for me at that time. I didn't understand it either. But at least we thought, well, you know, there's a chance. I was taking five different kinds of pills. So I've suffered from high blood pressure for, oh, something like over 15 years. And I, because I work for the U.S. government, you know, I went from base to base to base. And every place I went to, I asked the doctors, you know, I said, look, can you take away this diuretic for me? I was taking five different kinds of pills only for my heart. But the worst one was a diuretic because I knew it was sort of affecting my, you know, brain. Now, of course, I didn't have much, but, you know, <laughs> you feel it, you know. Uh, so I said, if you could, you know, take it out for me. You know, he says, well, I can give you another one. Another what? Another diuretic. Now, that's not going to help. But I said, then, how long must I take this? He said, your lifetime. You have to take it throughout your life. Well, that's my heart. 
that's my doing. So I said, okay, I finally resigned. Okay, I'll take it for a lifetime. And you know what? Uh, then, of course, this thing happened to me, and then uh, I went to Wima. And in it's a 19-day program. In 19 days, they took away four of those, and that includes the diuretic. I was taking over 15 years, this diuretic. And all the places, how many doctors I've seen, they say, no, you have to take your lifestyle. And I go to hear this, you know, Wilma Institute, Health Institute, and in 19 days, they go away, so you don't need it. And so you don't have to worry about heart attack. And since that time, say, go back to, her, you know, Hawaii, and see your cardiologist, see your doctor. One pill that's left was a minor pill. He said, he'll take it away. You know, if you keep on losing weight, I lost some more weight, and sure enough, one month later, he took it away. So five pills, and one of those I was supposed to take a lifetime. He, they, you know, all those were taken away. Today, I don't take any pills. I'm a vegan. And so I know it's a program that works. So we decided to, you know, so we, we told the people, said, look, the way to overcome this, you have to exercise and you know, all these principles, but especially nutrition. They said, vegetarian, what do you eat? You eat lettuce and carrots? You know, they don't know, you know, he said, I don't know how to prepare vegetarian food. And that's where we said, okay, then we have to show the people how to do it. And that's why my wife and I started this, you know, vegetarian cooking. Wow, that is so good. How many people here have tasted raw food? <laughs> oh, not bad. <laughs> I actually went to dinner one time with four guys from England who all ordered hamburgers and all took the lettuce off the hamburger. There's no model in nature for the consumption of cooked food. There's not a creature that eats cooked food. There's no creature that demonstrates an innate desire to consume cooked food. We see that babies are raised on raw food. They're raised on mother's milk. Somehow, we lost touch with our own innate desires. I wake up in the mornings now, and I feel like I felt when I was five years old. Open my eyes, I'm ready to go. It's instantly, it's not like, well, I need to give me two hours before I get ready. When I made the transition to raw food 19 years ago, you know, the information was there. All you had to do was look at nature. But there weren't the books, there weren't the teachers, there wasn't the leaders, there weren't the vocabulary, we hadn't had the insights. The raw food program has worked for millions and millions. The, the scientists who study it say that creatures have been eating raw food on planet Earth for 800 million years. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org.